Y'all, I'm pumped about Pastor Adam Bellamy. Guys, Pastor Adam has been a, an amazing resource for us. He's spoken at our rural revival meetings. Uh, he came to Deeper Conference for the first time last year, and he said, man, this, this has changed my life. I've got to be a part. And so I said, listen, not only are you going to come back and be a part, we want you to come and, and be one of our speakers at this thing. That's right. Him and his wife, Tracy, are probably one of the most thoughtful people we've ever met and just a breath of fresh air to us. Would you welcome Pastor Adam Bellamy from Thrive Church to the stage? Oh, thank you guys so much, man. I'm, I am stoked to be here. Uh, if you're wondering about the boot, I ordered the whole Iron Man suit. Only one part of it came in. So that's kind of what we're rocking. Um, one, I'd love to say thank you so much for having me. Unfortunately, this will be my last time at Deeper. Um, every time there's been a fantastic leader, whether it's a, a, a coach or, or a leader in business, the guy who follows him always gets fired. <laughs> and so I looked at Pastor Bo and I'm like, you are a goat. You are one of the goats of preaching. I love listening to him. I, I listen to your all's podcast. I tune in to, to everything that Pastor Bo does. I'm not only a, a, a fan, I'm a, I'm a bit of a follower. And uh, I looked at him, he said, man, we were so thoughtful to have you go right after me. And I said, Pastor Bo, it's because you're going to fire me. As soon as I'm done, you're going to replace me. But uh, we're going to swing at it. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, if I say this name, if I say Vincent Jackson, does anybody know who I'm talking about? Come on. The Reverend Vincent Jackson. Some people know him as Bo Jackson. Now, I'm going to talk to some people my age. I'm almost 50 years old. I know what you're thinking. You look much older than that, but it's the truth. I'm almost 50. And I want to, can I just, can I take a minute and just take you back in time for a second? I want to play a quick Bo Jackson video just to make sure that you're all did lead up. Here we go. Check it out. Come on, come on. Man, Bo Jackson was, was uh, just an all-time leader. He still holds the 90-plus uh, rushing record from the line of scrimmage. But here's the thing that a lot of people don't know, and you, you saw it in the video. Not only was he a fantastic, fantastic NFL running back, but he's also an amazing baseball player. He was the only guy to get the MVP in both sports. And so I sit here, and I was like, man, can you imagine being good enough, first of all, to be a pro at one sport? Listen, I fell getting off a curb. <laughs> like, I'm not going to make it. But let alone to do, to do professional sports, on two, two sports on that level, is just a feat that, that probably very few people are ever going to be able to touch in generations that we know. Because here's what I know, Bo knows sports. But as I got ready for tonight, I, I thought, I actually have a shirt that I was supposed to switch into. I wear it tomorrow, it says Bo knows. But it's spelled like our pastor Bo. <laughs> because here's what I know. Man, the heel's been through some transitions. In case you didn't know. I feel like some of you may have slept through it. But the hill went through some transition. Now, here's the thing. The whole time y'all were transitioning, I was rocking my free hill hat because they were giving them away because it wasn't going to be the hill anymore. 
And then, wait, it's going to get better. Then I stole Make Jesus Famous and tattooed it on my arm. Yeah, time out. But then Pastor Bo comes back, because here's what I know. Bo knows Jesus. And Bo knew enough that when he got to a place, he turned around and went back up, back the other way. Not only does he preach it, but he lives it. Because here's what I know. I know Bo knows. Man, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, Pastor Bo not only runs three campuses as a leader, he speaks to pastors across the country and around the world. And he reached out to somebody in nowhere, North Carolina. Because Bo knows Jesus. And Bo knows people. So I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, brother, it is an honor to say that Bo knows. More importantly, it's important for me to say, I know Bo. Because around here, that'll get you somewhere. I want to take you to one more thing, though. I, I think that Bo knows, and I think that Bo knows, but I think that God knows. And here's what I think. I think, I think that there's some people that came in tonight, and here's what you're asking for. You're asking for a word from God. Maybe you've, been, maybe you've been wrestling with where your place is. Maybe you've been wrestling in that place that Pastor Bo talked about where you, you sit there and you're like, man, I, I, I just feel like, like everything is falling apart. I'm not even sure I want to do this anymore. Now this is whether you're a pastor, a volunteer, a student. We all hit these places where we feel like things die. Here's what I want to say. If you came looking for the Lord, you came looking for a word, you came looking for a sign, this is your moment. Because here's what I know. When, when I came here a year ago, I, I, I just was looking for something different. I was looking for a tribe. I was looking for a group of people. I was looking for a connection. And through church boom, I met Pastor Bo. And then he invited me to stay at his house. And I said, man, are you sure your wife is okay with this? Because you met me on the internet. <laughs> like, I'm not even a girl. You met a dude on the internet, and you invited me to your house. And then he's like, hey, Pastor Adam, here's the thing. I want you to stay with me. I, I, I want to hang out with you. I want to spend some time with you. Here's the other thing I want to do. Hey, man, he called me like two days later. He's like, hey, would you MC one little part? And I'm like, look, bro, I don't know. I've never been to a deeper. I haven't even been to a shallower. Like, man, I don't know. I don't know what y'all are doing. I don't know. I don't know, like, any of the rhythm of this. He said, like, come on, man, it'll be great. I said, bet, I'm there. A week later, he calls me and goes, hey, there's this Pastor Kevin over in this place called Nevada. I said, Nevada? He said, Nevada. And I met Pastor Kevin and Kelly. And then I got to come back a year later and celebrate their, their launch of their second service. 300 and some people in the room. I'm just going to say, when God begins to open some stuff up that you thought was dead, oftentimes God has this ability to bring things back to life when you didn't think they were able to come back to life. And here's what I feel like. I feel like there's some people that have been wrestling with these dead places in their life. You've been wrestling with these shallow places in your life. And you're under the misunderstanding that it's actually dead. But here's what I know. This is your third day. This is the moment where you come in and God begins to birth and even rebirth what you thought was dead. So I want to, I want to go on a journey with me. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, 1 through 14. I don't have anything clever, just the word. Is that fair? Because if you're not coming back, this is all I've got. <laughs> Ezekiel 37 verse 1, it says this. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Don't forget it. See, here's what happens. It gets easy for us to begin to do processes and forget the fact that the hand of the Lord is upon you. You've been anointed. You've been anointed for this season, for this rhythm, for this culture, for this year, for the place that you're preaching. God has anointed you because His hand is on you. He said this, He said, I brought you and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and he set me down in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. 
And then he led me around. Sometimes we only think that God is leading us when he leads us into living places. Come on, man. Sometimes what you have to do is sit in the middle of the dead things and just look at them. Sometimes you've got to sit in the middle of the dead thing and just wonder. Said, and he set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. I've had some of those people in my church. <laughs> Dusty. But you know what's saddest when you wake up one day and you're the dusty one? Especially if you're a pastor and you wake up and rather than, than rivers of living water flowing out of you, it's a dust storm. God led him to this place and he says this. He said, and then he said to me, Son, you know, I had this epiphany that God has never called me pastor. Only son. Because son is a position with God that I can't lose. See, what I think we do is we get really tied up in us. I like my title. I like that I got reserved parking with a cone. I like that people think I'm somebody. But here's the thing. When God looks at me, all he sees is son. Because here's the thing, I can fool you from the stage, but daddy knows. Man, daddy knows. Dad knows when you need a hug, and dad knows when you need a... Well, you get it. I mean, I'm just saying, sometimes dad knows. And so he sits there and he goes, son, can these bones live? And here's the thing, I think that, that oftentimes we're at this place where God looks at you and goes, hey, can your church do it? Hey, do you, do you still have the fire? Do you still have it in you? Is this still your season? Is this still your place? Is this still the thing that you want to do? And I love, I love the man of God's response. Oh, Lord God, you know. Can you imagine God looking at you and going, Son, can these bones live? Son, can your marriage be put back together? Son, can, can, can your life be put back together? Son, can your finances really be put back together? Son, son, can it happen? And I love his response. God, you know. Because here's the thing. I think that, I think that the man of God had more questions than he had answers. If you're really going to be a pastor, those that were... We're, we're ordained today, first of all, I say, man, welcome to the club. Welcome to the club of not knowing. Welcome to the club of not having all the answers, but everybody expects you to. Welcome to the club of feeling more isolated than you feel like you've got friends because you haven't figured your tribe out yet. You're wondering how it's all going to work out and God's, God's looking at you going, can it happen? Is this the season? And you're like, God, only you know. Here's what I believe. I believe that, that some people are here and they're at the place where they're asking the question, can their ministry live again? Can their marriage live again? Can their children come back to the faith again? I think that you're asking some questions that God really wants to begin to, to, to push you into the season of wondering. How do you know, that, how many of you know that, that when God wants to birth something, He often starts with wonder? I remember when I planted a church, I wondered if anybody was going to show up. We did, listen, we planted with 12 people. I've got a gift. I grew them down to eight. Listen, I'm an amazing pastor. I've got a gift of goodbye. I don't know. It's, and I asked God, God, can you do something in and through me in this season of my life? Because God only you know. So as we continue to move through in verse 4, He said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I'm the Lord. Can I say this? I love a prophetic word. Like, man, I love, I love when somebody speaks something and it rattles me from the inside. But can I say this? You're going to hit a day where there's nobody there to prophesy over you. You're going to hit a season where you don't need another prophetic word. You need to prophesy over yourself. That you need to, you need to remember that God is about to put some stuff together that you aren't able to. That you are still His son, you are still His daughter, and that His hand is still on you, and that God is still leading you, and He's about to. You need to look at your neighbor and say, He's about to. You need to look at your other neighbor and say, You're my second choice. (laughs) But He's still about to. All the married people, you should have started with your wife. (laughs) Oftentimes we look and we say this, I wonder if. I wonder if these bones can come back to life. And what God said, if you notice before anything changed, He said they shall live. Man, the mark of a great leader is not seeing what's dead, it's seeing life. The mark of a good leader is not focusing on who it doesn't like you, it's about focusing on who does. It's not asking for God to increase your platform, it's about speaking off the platform that you're on. It's about about doing these things when you're like, man, God said that through me, things will come back to life. So you know what, when I feel like I'm not doing good, I lay my hand on myself, and I begin to prophesy. I am a man of God. I'm a son of God. I, I, have, I have life that flows out of me. There may be some haters, but guess what? The Reverend Mike Dick has said this. He said 50% of the world is going to love you and 50% is going to hate you. So just be you. Because here's the thing. I come to impress my father, not the kids. Does this make sense? Like when you live under, under sonship and you say, you know what? I'm going to begin to speak to dry places. They can be dry places in my life or they can be dry places in your life. But I'm speaking to dry places. Jesus gives his, 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 his profile for his ministry. He gives his mission statement. He said, man, I've come. I've come to bind up the brokenhearted. I've come to release captives. I've come to... And I often wonder this. Because Jesus was the king of sneaking away. Jesus would creep out of a situation. Like we feed 5,000 people. We say, all right, boys, get in the boat. I'll see you in a little bit. I'm going to pray. How you sneak away from 5,000 men plus women and children? That's a gift. Because I always get hung at my church by the craziest people at the back door before I can get out for lunch. All my pastors know what I'm talking about. And they don't have a short anything. Verse 7 says this, it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. Who told you to stop? Who told you to stop sharing what God put in your heart? Who told you to stop? Who told you to change? Who told you to give up? Who told you to switch? Who told you to change churches? Who told you? And if God didn't tell you to stop... Then son, daughter, get back to it. You don't need a new word. You just need to do the one you've got. Come on. Anybody's daddy. Listen, I was born in 1975. If you laugh, you're going to hell. I'm just telling you it's the way it is. But let me ask you, anybody, anybody have to push mow their yard? Okay, I grew up in Tennessee. My dad was cheap, so he bought a, a he, he had a riding lawnmower. He used to ride me till I mowed the yard. And so, so what would happen is I would I would mow, but I was lazy. So I would mow the front yard and think that was good enough. 
And then I go inside because it was Saturday morning and we didn't have cable. We had Saturday morning cartoons. And when they went off, it was golf the rest of the day. Come on. And so my dad would come in and he'd be like, son, are you done mowing the yard? I'm like, the front. And he's like, I guess you got something to do. My son is getting married in two weeks. I'm super stoked. Hey, yeah. But he, he just graduated college, and he's a paramedic. And, and he looked at me. He's like, Dad, I, I need to get a place for me and my future wife to live. And I'm like, that's good, son. How much money you got? And he said, he said, oh, well, well, not a lot because you know, I've been a college student. I'm like, well, son, you know where broke people go? <laughs> Work. Oh, yeah, that's true. We do still live at home, so there is that. Pastor Bo, I'm just. But he's not 40. But anyway, so what happened was, what? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He did. No, he did that. He set that up. That was not my fault. That was not honor above, below, all around. Okay, so. Come on. I told y'all it was going to be my last time here. He said, and as I prophesied, there was a sound. I love this. A rattling. Man, if you hadn't been rattling lately, you haven't been asking the right questions. If you haven't been rattled, it's because you haven't been close enough to the presence of God for Him to tell you to call something that you thought was dead back to life. Because once you're done with you, what you begin to do is see the death in other people and you see it so that you can speak life into it. He said, man, I was there and I heard a rattle. Here's a funny thing about rattles. They scare you. My wife and I have an agreement. She decorates the house. I go see what the noise was. So here's what I know that it, it, for my, my wife, one time we were laying in bed and she's like, I heard something. And I'm like, it's, it's probably the dog go back to sleep. And she's like, no, I hear men talking. And I'm like, it's God. Just say, speak, Lord, the servant here. <laughs> like, listen, at three in the morning, I'm do, like, I'm, I'm not on a game. Right. And she goes, and then I heard two dudes talking. Now, listen, I'm from the South. You can judge this. If you don't like guns, I'm sorry. Don't be offended by this. But I keep a gun by my bed. I grab a gun, grab the flashlight. I go out. I spotlight these two guys in my front yard. I draw down like dirty Harry. I am on it, right? And these two guys turn around, and they got these stars on their shirt. And they're like, sir, go back in your house. And I'm like, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Click, click, click. <clears throat> they were looking for a drunk driver who ran through my yard. I'm like, I hope you all find him. And so... <laughs> My point is this, is that anytime you hear a rattle, it always causes action. God sit there and He said, man, maybe I brought you to deeper so that something would rattle inside of you. That, that something you thought was dead. Because rattles, whether they're small or big, are scary. But here's what I believe, that rattles cause breakthroughs. Because when I rattle... Come on, some type A men in the house got to know what I'm talking about. When I hear the noise, I don't go under the bed. I grab something. A gun, a bat, a golf club. And I go towards, towards the problem. I believe Pastor Bo just preached on this. That maybe if there's a dry place in your life, what God wants you to do is rather run from it. Run towards the rattle. Run towards the part that you thought was dead. Verse 8 says this. He said, And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and there was flesh had come upon them, and they covered them, but there was no breath in them. But here's the problem, is that sometimes we think sinews and muscles and a little bit of skin are enough. As long as it looks alive, it'll pass. As long as it looks good from the outside, it's okay. As long as I look good, as long as people think as a pastor, as a church leader, that I'm good, I'm good. The problem is, the bones are still dead. I wonder how many leaders came in today and you're dead on the inside. Dude, you got the new deeper shirt. You got the wristband. You even have the new hat. 
which I haven't gotten yet. <laughs> Said this, but there was no breath in him. Now notice that when they were dry bones, he looked at me and said, I want you to prophesy to them. But now when it looks alive, but it's not really alive, it's not fully alive, he looks at him and, and he, again he says this, he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Here's the thing. Don't let your calling only get halfway. Don't let it only be halfway awake. What you need to do is you need to learn to prophesy. You need to learn to speak to your problems. You need to speak to your rattles. And you need to see what God is really able to do in them. I got rattled. So um, I ran around with 11 guys in high school. Ten of them died violently. One went to prison. And at the last one, I uh, committed suicide. And I was 17. And I ran from God as hard as I could. And I was at the last friend's funeral. And his sister looked at me. And she said, Adam, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. I'm not emotionally, spiritually, anything equipped for this. And I went home that night. It was on a Tuesday. And I said, God, if you let me live to tomorrow... I'll give my life to you. I'll do anything you want me to do. And I did. But then he said, I want you to be a pastor. <laughs> Wrong guy. <laughs> we, we have a communication problem. <laughs> I was praying. I said, God, if, if, it's, if it's you, I need you, I need you to show me. This guy said, hey, there are five people right now. We were praying before we started. Uh, I was living for a week on the streets as part of a missions project. And they said, hey, look, there are five people being called in the ministry. If it's you, you know it. I want you to step forward. And I was sweating. It was cold outside, but I was saying, anybody ever been there? Because I heard it rattling inside of me. And I began to prophesy to myself. And they said, man, if it's you, step forward. And I went. And I looked up, and there were three guys. And I thought, see, God, you were wrong. And from the back of the church, two guys came in weeping. And they said, man, we're dealing with the call to ministry. Will you pray with us? Five people heard the rattle. So here's the thing. From that moment on, whenever I felt discouraged, I'd prop the side of myself. I'm like, God, not only did you call me in a church, but you sent two dudes off the street so I knew it was you. So if you're looking for a sign, here's your sign. You're called. You need to begin to speak to yourself. You need to speak to your gifting. Stop downplaying them. You need to lean into them and let God do everything that He wants to do through you. Here's what I believe. I believe that in, until your calling is fulfilled, you have to keep prophesying to yourself until your problems pass. If you're here and you're like, you know what, I... Pastor, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Let me tell you something. I got t-shirts from it. <laughs> Literally. You know, what I started doing was, was, was I began to speak to myself. And I asked God, I said, man, wh what's my call? And he said, man, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. And I'm like, dude, I'm not a world traveler. And he's like, yeah, but I need you to go to the bowling alley culture. And the hunter culture. And the chief's culture. And yeah, y'all are suckers for that. And and I need you, like I, I need you to step in to the cultures that I've called you to because every people group is a tribe. If I say if I say go to Africa and, and, and speak to this tribe, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's a that's a people group. But you know what? Up north is a people group. And down south is a people group. And the Midwest, let me tell you something. Y'all name your, your roads with letters. We don't have that. I turned on U, K, and H today, and I'm like, Huck. I was really hoping to hit an L in there, and then I'd been like, yeah, anyway. Verse 10 said, so I prophesied as he commanded me. You can't leave here today without prophesying as God's commanded you. You're not afforded the luxury of leaving and voiding your own calling. He said, I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Here's the thing. If you quit on your promise, you kill the army. 
See, we're in generational ministry. We're not afforded the luxury to get in pain and stop. My, I, I talked to my doctor and he said, look, I need you to boot for like eight to ten weeks. We're going to decide next week if, you, if we put pins in your feet. And I said, well, let me tell you something. We ain't putting pins in my feet until after my son's wedding. Because I got a dope pair of shoes and I got one kid. <laughs> and he asked me to do his ceremony. So let me tell you something, coach. I'm about to play hurt. I'm about to play hurt because I care more about the game than I do about my foot. God gave me two of them. I come in here next year with a peg leg. I'll dress like a pirate. I don't care because, I'm, because I've decided that even if I have to play wounded, I don't come out of the game. So here's the word. If you're here, God wants you sometimes just to play wounded. Begin to speak to yourself. Begin to call those things that aren't as though they are. Because there is an army that's waiting on you to prophesy. There's an army that's waiting on you to show up. There's a people group. I, lo I love the, the, the ordination candidate who was like, yeah, he got saved at this campus and now he's here. And I was like, army up. Come on. Ne next. Because here's what I believe. This is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the hill. Is every time I'm here and I'm only here once a year, y'all are ordaining people. I love church multiplication because it's, it's biblical. It's in Acts. I love the fact that, that Pastor Bo's got three campuses and I'm leaving for four or five before I come back. Like, I love, the, I love pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> Only guys clap for that. I love expectancy that something is about to give birth. When my wife was pregnant, I'd lay my hands on her stomach and I would talk to my son. I would pray over my son. I would pray against things that I didn't want, like the color of hair. I didn't want a girl. Not because I, I don't like girls. I just don't know how to raise one. But I lived in every day in the expectation of what that child would grow up to be. What God is birthing in you, here's the question. If you prophesy over it, what could it grow up to be? What could God really do in you? Verse 11, and then he said to me, he said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and indeed we are cut off. Well, there's a prophet. Anybody ever felt like this? When you looked at your checkbook, you're like, we're toast. The funds have dried up. There's nothing left. Anybody ever looked at their spouse? Any pastors ever sat in the parking lot? And you look at your church and you're like, you know what? It's dried up. It's gone. There's nothing left. I've been cut off. Here's the thing. Uh, in those moments, you become desperate. Desperate is dangerous. I love dangerous people. Dangerous people, desperate people, do desperate things. Like push through a crowd and touch the hem of a garment. That, that, they come to the altar before the altar call. They don't, they don't care who sees them weep. They don't care who sees them raise a hand. They don't see who, who sees them reach out to the world around. Desperate people have nothing to lose. God said this, He said, if you're really going to be what I've called you to be, I'm going to need you to become desperate as I close. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from the graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken it, and I will do it, says the Lord. Here's the word I need to leave you with. God put it in you. No, God put it in you. God put it in you. It's already there. It's already inside of you. The thing you've been wrestling with, the thing you've been running from, is already inside of you. And what God needs you to do is speak to it. He needs you to act on it. He needs you to not give up on it, not abort it before it can be born. What He needs you to do is give birth to it. And in time, 
you'll see it grow up. And in that moment, God will be glorified. You receive this. As we come to close, just let me pray. Father, for every heart that's here, that you're trying to birth something in. For every person here that's come into this house and they've been looking for a sign. They thought that their ministry was over. They thought that, that there's no way that God could use them. They thought that, that, that things were hopeless. They thought that there was, there was not another chapter. They thought there was not another season. They thought that there, was, there wasn't a do-over. There wasn't a second chance. God, let this be their moment. Let it be a moment where heaven touches earth. God, when you let your presence surround them, when you call them son or you call them daughter, because that's what they are, and the calling that's inside of them is because they're a son or daughter, and you want to do what only you can do. You want the dry bones to come to life because armies need to be raised up. The generations need to be changed. The cultures need to be altered. Father, I ask that right now you change hearts and lives across this building. In Jesus' name.